If you have your Bibles this morning, let me invite you, if you would, to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter number 1. While you're turning there, we've got a few uh, prayer requests that I want to mention and ask you to keep in prayer, if you would. It was brought to my attention that there's a young man by the name of Sebastian Smith who was in an automobile accident, and I believe he's in Deaconess Hospital right now and uh, having some medical care, so if you would keep him and his family in your prayer. Uh, Brother Cheryl is in uh, Good Sam. She's had an issue with her stomach, and they've placed her in. She went in yesterday to the emergency room. They kept her overnight. Um, I believe that they're trying a procedure. Dan, is that right? They've got a tube down her throat. And if everything goes according to plans, hopefully she'll be able to go home tomorrow. But keep her in your prayers, if you would. H.C. Fields is going to be going in for a procedure. Uh, he's had some bleeding that needs to be addressed, so if you would, keep him in your prayers. Elaine Fuller is going Wednesday to Effingham to St. Anthony's to have a knee replacement, so we want to keep Elaine in our prayers. And Bargesser is back at Countryside. They've put a couple of stents in her main artery, and they have a couple more they need to do, but they're going to try to let her get a little stronger. Uh, Jim Wilson is doing much better, but he goes back to the doctor this Thursday, I believe it is. So keep Jim and Maxine in your prayers. And then a very special prayer for Rex and Betty Hodge, if you would. Uh, Brother Rex is not doing very well at all. They've called hospice in, and uh, it's just a difficult time for the family. So keep them in your prayers, if you would, uh, as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's again ask his blessings on the preaching of the word, and that he would receive all the honor in glory today. Father, we come to you now. And as we open your word, we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit might take the words that are spoken. And that, Father, he might direct them to our hearts. Help us not to only hear with our physical ears, but help us to hear with our spiritual ears. And help us to understand that in this life there are choices that we are going to make. And those choices will have an impact on eternity. Help us to remember and to realize that you have given us your word, that it is the truth, that it is the compass for life, and that, Father, as we get into it and as we study it and as we learn it and as we apply those truths with the help of the Holy Spirit, that our lives can be pleasing to you and you can get honor and glory and we can have a, a part in the building of your kingdom. We pray for these that we've just mentioned, Lord, that are going through difficult times and for many others who have struggles and heartaches in life. We're so grateful that not only do you hear our prayers, but, Father, you answer our prayers according to your will. And we pray, Father, that you would work and move in each one of these and that you would receive honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. We come to Psalms chapter number one. Now, we've been going through the uh, study of the life of David, and we've not covered all the areas of David's life, but we're going to look at Psalms one today, and then next week we're going to look at uh, Psalms 23 uh, in reference to David writing that particular psalm, and then we're going to bring our, our study of David to a conclusion at the end of next week. But as we come to Psalms chapter number one, in most Bibles you'll notice there's no title there. and I mean, there's no... There's no indication of who wrote that psalm. And I will tell you that there are discussions amongst many uh, much wiser men than me as to who wrote this. Some believe it was David, and I fall into that category, okay? I want to make that clear from, from the outset. But there are some believe that this was written at a later time in the history of, of the nation of Israel. But the, 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 this particular psalm and what it has to say sets the tone and the text for everything else that goes on in the book of Psalms. As a matter of fact, most people believe that you could either call this an introduction to the book or a basic overview of everything that Psalms talks about. And what it really talks about is, as, as I mentioned in the prayer, that we have choices that we must make in life. And in this particular passage of Scripture, there is a choice to serve God or a choice to serve the world or the flesh. And each one of those choices, whichever we choose, will have an impact on our eternity. And I hope we can, we can bring that out in, in a very clear sense. You'll notice in Psalms, in, in verses 1 through 3, 
that it talks about the blessings on those that follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And it reminds me of the passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter number 7 when Jesus was talking about the straight gate and the broad gate. You remember? And he talked about that broad gate and how wide it was and how many were on that road. But you remember in Jesus' own words there, he said, it is the road that leads to destruction. And what he's talking about there is the road that, he, that leads to eternal punishment. Then he talked about that straight gate. And that straight gate there were a few people on, but it leads to life. And that's basically the context that the writer of this particular psalm, who I again to believe, believe to be David, is writing about and telling us that we have a choice in life. And I want to go on record as saying this again. It really does pay to serve God. It really does. Now, I understand that we can put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I understand that we can strive to serve Him to the best of our ability. And we still may face issues and struggles and difficulties in life. But I'm telling you, even in those difficulties and those struggles of life, we have one who is with us, one who will guide us, one that will encourage us and strengthen us and enable us to bear up under that load, one that we can go to because He's there for us. I love the promise of Scripture that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. When you think about this passage of Scripture, He starts off by saying, Blessed is the man. When I think about blessed, I wrote a little definition down here. It's a joyful mental state of contentment, a condition of comfort and security. Now, there are those that believe that word there is, is, is just a praise to God, and I think we can praise God, can you? How happy is the man is basically the statement that's being made. And here's what I'm telling you, that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves to him and we strive to serve him and live as he would have us to, it produces a joy, a peace, and a happiness in life, does it not? And what the psalmist is saying here, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, we've got, we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis, all right? And you remember how that when Adam and Eve were created and they were in the garden there, they had a fellowship with God and there was a peace in, in, in the garden until chapter 3 when, that, when the serpent came and spoke to Eve and said, hath God said. And folks, the devil's been throwing out that same lie ever since that. He will speak to people and it is God really right did God really say that? And he tries to take the truth of God and he tries to twist it a little bit and change it around and compromise it to where it loses its impact and its effectiveness. And in this passage of Scripture, what he's talking about, even in David's day and also in our day, there are two different worldviews out here. We have the worldview of the Lord Jesus Christ or of Almighty God who says, put your faith and trust in me, look to me, I will guide you, direct you, and peace and joy and happiness will be in life, and eternity with me is the end result. And then there's the worldview that's out there. So God's just trying to keep you from having fun. You need to live after the, 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 the desires of the flesh and the things of the world. You need to enjoy life here and now. And the result of that is, as we're going to find out, is a very negative, negative result, Okay. When he says, blessed is the man, happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. When we think about counsel, we think of plan or advice, right? Can I tell you something? We all need advice. Would you agree with that? We all need at times for someone who's a little more in tune to what's going on, someone who's experienced what we're going through. It's nice to have somebody there that we can go to, that we can ask and request advice from, what should I do in this matter? And I want you to know that when it's all said and done, God is ultimately the one that we need to go to, as David had done many times in his life. When he was facing a decision, he would seek the will and the direction of Almighty God. And I think it's good for us to surround ourselves with people who have put their faith faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, have a desire to live Him, and it's good to be able to go to them and seek advice. I can tell you right now from first-hand experience, the, the advice that you get from a child of God will be much different than what you get from the world, all right? And when you look at this man, what he's talking about, not only does, does he walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
but it says, nor standeth in the seat of, uh, in the way of sinners. Now, what he's talking about here, if you notice, there's, there is a natural progression in the life of man. If we start tuning our ear into the ungodly, the next thing you know, we're going to stop and begin association with them. And then when you begin to associate with them, the next thing you've got is we fall into that category where we begin to mock or scoff, as it says in that next verse. Let me remind you what 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says. Evil communications will corrupt good we need to make sure and understand that when we put ourselves in positions of, of danger, that sometimes it will rub off on us, and the end result is it can have a negative impact in our witness and in our testimony. You heard the old saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. It's true, isn't it? We need to make decisions that, 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 are, that are godly and, and decisions that are, that are upright. Not only does he stand in the counsel of the ungodly, but notice uh, he, 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 it, says, it goes on and says, and, and standeth in the way of sinners, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful. And the word scornful there really means to be a mocker of God. We must avoid the influence of the world. Now that doesn't mean we're pulled out of the world. We, 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 we live in this world but we have choices as to who we associate with on a long-term basis. I will tell you this from a first-hand experience. When I'm at work, not everybody that I work with knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And not everybody that I work with um, lives as what I would choose to live myself personally. There is going to be a contact with them, but I don't have to choose to associate with them. And I don't have to choose to go where they go and do what they do. I choose to try to put God first in my life and live for Him so that I can be a witness and an encouragement to those that I'm around about. And let me tell you something. I believe this with all my heart. It's important to share the Word, but we better be living so that our life backs up what we talk about. If I'm talking a good talk but not walking a good walk, they know that. They see that. And so do folks around you as well. So when he makes the statement, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He says in verse number 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And I want you to understand the importance of God's word in our life as Christians. We, we've made the comment before. Scripture tells us that we are saved by faith, right? We walk by faith. We live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It is vitally important for you and I as children of God to spend time in this book learning the Word of God and learning who Jesus Christ really is and, and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us through His Word so that we can grow up in the image of Jesus Christ so that at some point in time when people look at me, they don't see Al Smith, they see Jesus Christ in me. And I want you to know the Bible teaches very clearly that when Jesus Christ is lifted up, he draws men and women, boys and girls to Him. And if we are going to have a life that is going to give evidence and is going to be a witness for our Lord and Savior, it starts by being in the book. And I want you to understand with me too, there are a lot of books about the Bible today. And you can grab books to help explain things and talk about things. And that may be very well. But never let other books take the place of the book this book is one we need to spend time in each and every day of our life. Verse 2 says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. And what that means is He not only reads it, but He thinks about it, and He tries to process it. Now, have you guys, I'll just share with you where, where I am sometimes. Have you ever read something, and you just kind of, when you're done, it's like, what? Huh? You ever done that? You, 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 you'll, you'll read a passage of Scripture and, and whew, that's why it's important to take time to meditate, to search out, compare Scripture with Scripture. You know? Let, 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 let the other Scriptures help us to understand. I, I share the, the, the illustration uh, quite often when I was first saved and I, I, had, I had gone to a different church when I was a boy and, and when I got older I didn't think I needed church anymore. And so I, I quit going to church for a period of time. And when I was 20 years of age, 
I had a man on the job began to witness to me and share with me about Jesus Christ. And make a long story short, as I've told you a number of times, I, I went to church one Thursday evening at a revival meeting, and they gave that preacher those notes, and man, he hit me right between the eyes, both barrels, right? And I remember after I got saved and I put my faith and trust in him, and, and as we started to try to grow, I didn't know a whole lot, folks. I, 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 I struggled to have an understanding of so many things. But as, as I continued to read and as God put people in my life to help answer questions and give me guidance and direction, I began to learn a few things. And it's amazing, as we, as we search things out and as we strive to know exactly what it is, the truths that God wants for us, the Holy Spirit will open our mind and our understanding and allow us to be able to get our minds and our hands around that thing. And when we get, when we focus, only come to a place that we can understand what it is the next step is make application and how can I make application to life so that God can live his truth out through me it comes through what the psalmist is talking about here when he says meditate day and night think about it how does this impact me how can God use this truth in my life to make me a blessing and an encouragement to those around about me Spend some time in it. I know this, the more, we, the more time we spend in this book and the more time we seek to truly know what this book is telling us and what God has for us, the more it will be evidenced in our daily lives and the more impact in a positive way we can be to those around about us. And when it's all said and done, we are vessels that God wants to use to bless those outside of our church building. Make us a blessing to them and an encouragement and a help to them. Now notice verse number 3, if you would. It goes on and says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now the picture of this is, the tree planted by the river of waters is basically a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? When we strive, to get into God's Word, and we strive to learn and understand God's Word, when we strive to be vessels through which God can work and God can move, the Holy Spirit will take us and He will use us to accomplish His plan and purpose in our lives. When He talks about that tree that's planted by the rivers of water, I made the statement a little earlier, we will struggle as Christians. We will have heartache. We will have grief. There will be times come when discouragement will, 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 will plague us. But here's what I'm telling you. Even in those times, Jesus Christ is there. Even in those times, he, ha he loves us, He cares for us, and He will provide all of our need according to His riches in glory. And when you look at that tree planted by the rivers of water... Drought may come and drought may go, but they're still, it's still producing fruit. You ever notice, if you go back, those of us that have been saved for any length of time at all, you go back, and sometimes in the most difficult times of our lives, it's when we shine the brightest from Jesus Christ. And when people look at us and say, they're different. They've got something that I don't have. And the point that I'm making is when it makes the statement there and bringeth forth his fruit in his season, I believe, and the way that I interpret that passage of Scripture is not that it brings forth when it's supposed to. I see that as, as, as a word of, of prophecy saying that God can use us in any place in our life, whether we're young, whether we're middle-aged, whether we're older, whether we're on the mountaintop or we're in the valley, God can use us to bring forth honor and glory for Him and produce fruit in our life. We simply need to be open and attuned to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And God will use us, and He will bless us and enable us to bring praise to His name. When it talks about His leaf shall not wither, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper you and I both know anything we do with lasting value is not us that does it it's God working in us and through us that accomplishes those things that remain after he talks about the man who is blessed he talks about those that do not put their do not have delight in the law of God, that do not follow him. Notice verse number four. 
The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff with the wind drives away. Now, folks, let me say this, and I'm going to say this as, 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 try to say this as compassionately and as kindly as I can. The world looks at Christians today and say, man, you're missing. You're missing out on all the fun of life. You're missing out on all that this world has to offer. But what they don't understand is, is that path that they're on and the direction that the world is leading one day has an end. And when that end comes, they will also stand before the ultimate judge. When Jesus Christ sits on that throne and they stand before him, he's looking for one thing, folks. He's not looking for how much money you made in this world. He's not looking for how, much, how many degrees you've got hanging on the wall. He's not looking for anything other than have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and is his blood applied to the doorposts of your hearts and have you been saved? When, when he makes the statement here, the ungodly are not so, he's talking about people that are living for their own desire, people that are living after the direction of the world, people that are following that spirit of antichrist that, we talk of, that the scripture talks about on a regular basis. And he says, they are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drive of the way. We know what chaff is, right? When you go back in the Old Testament and you look in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges and in other areas, when they were harvesting the wheat, they would take that, that, that product and they would throw it in the air on, on a breezy day and the, and the grain would fall. But what happened to that chaff? It was blown away. And basically the word chaff means worthless or no value. And when you look at this passage of Scripture, let me, let me, let me say this one more time. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary there and died on the cross of Calvary and that blood ran down red on that cross, that blood is sufficient to save whosoever will. I love it in the Bible when the Bible says whosoever will may come. I love it when the Bible tells us that, the, that he died for all people and it's a matter of coming and putting faith and trust in Jesus Christ. When you look at this passage of Scripture and it says they're like the wind that driveth away, it's not that they can't be saved, it's that they will not turn to Jesus Christ to be saved. We live in a world today, and I will say this, I'll use myself as an example, before, my, before I came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just anticipated I was going to get up tomorrow. I anticipated that everything was going to be fine. I was going to live life to the fullest. I was going to have as much fun as I could, never thinking that the day may come when my life might end. And here's what I want you to understand from me today. There is an appointed time for each and every one of us. And when that appointment, that time comes, We've got two choices, two, two destinations. If we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven is our home. If we've turned from him and rejected him in this life and refused to yield and submit to the Holy Spirit of God, eternal punishment will be ours. Notice what he goes on and says there in verse number 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There is a day coming when Jesus Christ will sit on the throne. There is a day coming when the dead are going to stand before him. There is a day coming when they will be judged according to the book of Revelation, chapter number 19, out of those things that are written in the book. They will be, they will be found to be guilty. There will be another book that, that is open there, and that's the book of life. And if their name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says that they were cast into the lake of fire. Can I ask you a question? How do we get our name in the Lamb's book of life? Only one way. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. To be found written in the Lamb's book of life, there must be a time in our life where the Holy Spirit of God has revealed to us our need, where we've fallen before Him in humility, where we've confessed our sins and we've asked Him to forgive our sins and save us, and that blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary then cleanses us from our sin and makes us acceptable to a holy and righteous God. There is a day coming when sinners will stand before God, and as He looks out at them and as He judges their life for what they've done in life, and there is no blood applied the end will be destruction now that's not popular to preach in our day and age 
That's not politically correct. But I want you to know this morning, based on the authority of the Word of God, it is biblically correct. There is a day coming when each and every person will stand before God. He's looking for one thing, and that one thing is the blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that blood is not seen, judgment will be meted out. Notice it goes on and says in verse number 6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Here's the good news. And I, let me, I'm going to do my best to paint a verbal picture for you today. Regardless of your age, when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ and you asked him to forgive your sins and to save you, and that blood washed and cleansed you and you became a child of God, you are on the road that leads to life. Right? Right? The end is, is that for those of us that have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just share a couple of good things we're going to experience. We're going to have a body that no longer has to worry about breaking down and getting sick. Do you like that? I, I do. I, I'm looking for a body, and, and no, more, no more bulges. You know what I'm talking about? I, I'm looking for a perfect body. That's one of the promises that God has given to us. I'm looking for that mansion over oh, oh, on the other side. I'm looking for that place that Jesus Christ has, has, is building for me. And, and I know there's debate on whether they're individual mansions or whether it's talking about the city in general. I, I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm looking for the time and the place where my reservation is where I am going to be able to dwell in the presence of Almighty God forevermore. Why? Because I'm worthy? Absolutely not. Because Jesus Christ saved me from my sin. I'll tell you what, I'm looking for the time when we're going to see him face to face. The one that gave it all for me. The one that gave it all for you. There is a day coming because of our faith in him where we are going to be able not only to stand before Him, but fall at His feet and worship Him for who He is and what He has done for us. He is Savior and Lord. And just to top it off, in my mind, the way I view things, is when I get there, I expect to see family and friends and those that are close to me gathered around that throne, and we will have perfect fellowship forevermore. God knows the way of the righteous, but the ungodly shall perish. And what the psalmist is simply saying there, folks, is it pays to serve God. It is well worth bowing before Him acknowledging our needs, confessing our sin, and receiving that amazing grace that He gives to us when we accept His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It pays to serve God. Every one of us here this morning have a day coming when we're going to stand before Him. And I guess the question for us this morning is this. Will we be prepared or will we be found wanting? I can tell you there's only one thing that merits our acceptance before a holy and righteous God. And that's the sacrifice of His Son, the blood that He shed. That is what enables us to be found worthy to stand before Him. The question this morning, I guess, is this. Is there a time in your life where you have bowed the knee and asked Jesus Christ to save you. If not, we give you an opportunity to do that today. If you've done that, and if you've experienced the forgiveness of sin, then I would encourage you to say, do as it says in verses 1 through 3, to avoid the counsel of the world. Spend time in the Word of God and be available for God to use you as he chooses and as he sees fit. 
I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please, with heads bowed and with eyes closed.